What can I do to reduce endometriosis pain? Who hasn't Googled it in those endless years between the first symptoms and the diagnosis, if not even after diagnosis? And the answer is mostly confusing between a just maintaining a healthy lifestyle and here is a list of foods you must and must not eat. I get it, I've been there too, so I decided to read all the scientific papers available and summarize them in this video to help you to understand what you can do against endometriosis related pain. Let's start! This video is for educational purposes only. Before making any changes to your diet, always consult with your doctor and dietitian. In case you don't know, endometriosis is an estrogen-dependent inflammatory condition characterized by the presence of tissues similar to the endometrium outside of the uterus. It affects more than 10% of people who menstruate, which includes premenopausal women, but also transgender men and non-binary people. The main symptoms include pain, during or outside menstruation, pain during sexual intercourse, pain during urination, heavy periods, gastric tissue, infertility, fatigue and much more. The link between endometriosis and diet has been suspected a long time ago, both because patients report that symptoms change in relation to certain food or dietary practices, but also because the fact that endometriosis is estrogen dependent and related to inflammation suggests just that dietary practices that help regulate these processes might also affect symptoms manifestation as well as disease risk and progression. However, finding a clear answer in nutrition and especially with such a complex disease of which we still know too little is easier said than done. In fact, there are many ways in which we can look at the association between diet and endometriosis. For example, a food group or nutrient that has been linked to endometriosis risk may not impact symptoms manifestation. These are very different research questions that need to be investigated independently. For this video, I decided to focus on whether dietary practices may help reduce endometriosis pain because I think it's the most urgent question that needs to be answered from a patient perspective. But before giving you an answer, we need to know what has been researched so far and what we can learn from those studies. The Mediterranean diet is broadly recognized as an anti-inflammatory and antioxidant dietary pattern. For this reason, it has been suggested that it may help alleviating endometriosis related pain and possibly may also affect the disease risk and progression. So far, two studies have been published investigating whether the Mediterranean diet might reduce endometriosis related pain. In both studies, women were asked to increase their intake of fruit and vegetables, legumes, whole grains, nuts and healthy fat, while also decreasing their intake of red meat, added sugar and animal fat. Both studies show a reduction of endometriosis related pain after following the Mediterranean diet for 5 months compared to the beginning of the study. However, these studies included only a handful of participants and especially did not have a control group. Studies without a control group and in which participants are aware of the intervention they are assigned to are considered at a higher risk of bias. In fact, because participants expect the treatment to work otherwise they wouldn't have accepted to participate in the study in the first place, they are unconsciously more prone to report a lower level of pain after treatment. Similarly to the Mediterranean diet, vegan diet is rich in anti-inflammatory and antioxidant compounds while pro-inflammatory inflammatory animal fats are completely excluded. Women often report a reduction in endometriosis related pain after going vegan and especially when the fat intake is also limited. However, so far only one study has investigated this association. In this study, 51 women who suffered from severe menstrual pain were randomly divided into two groups. The first group was asked to follow a low-fat vegan diet diet for two months after which they were asked to go back to their usual diet and take a daily supplement of vitamin B12. In the other group, the order of the diet and the supplement was reversed. At the end of the study, women reported significantly less 
pain intensity and duration in the months in which they were following the low fat vegan diet while little difference was noted in the months in which they were taking the supplements in addition to their usual diet the main issue with this study is that participants did not have to have a diagnosis of endometriosis to be included in the study but they had to suffer from severe and debilitating menstrual pain so we we don't really know if the same effect would be observed in women with endometriosis. Gluten is usually in the list of food to avoid in case of endometriosis but actually there is very little evidence against it. The only study that has been performed and is usually cited as a proof of the arm of gluten was conducted in a single group of women who were asked to rate their endometriosis related pain before and after following gluten-free diet for 12 months. 156 women out of the 207 included in the study actually reported a reduction in endometriosis related pain after following gluten-free diet compared to the beginning of the study, while the remaining 51 women did not report any difference in pain level. However, again there was no control group so also this study should be considered at a higher risk of bias. And even more in this case where the effect of gluten which has a bad reputation in general has been tested. So it is possible that the results we saw were due to the so-called nocebo effect, which occurs when we believe that a food component is harmful for us. So excluding it from our diet will result in us feeling better. Yet the fact that many patients with endometriosis report a benefit from a gluten-free diet might might not be completely due to the nocebo effect. In fact, it has been shown that people with endometriosis are at higher risk of developing autoimmune disorders such as celiac disease, but also gastric issues such as non-celiac gluten or wheat sensitivity and irritable bowel syndrome, also known as IBS. And so it could be that for those people who have both endometriosis and gut issue, and especially those with celiac disease, excluding gluten from the diet results in significantly less pain. But we still have not enough scientific evidence to say that a gluten-free diet is beneficial for all other types of endometriosis-related pain. FODMAP stands for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides and polyols which are short chain carbohydrates poorly digestible by our small intestine but at the same time highly fermentable by our gut microbiota. They can be found in dairy, wheat-based products, legumes and some fruit and vegetables. This excessive fermentation of FODMAP by the gut microbiota causes pain and bloating in susceptible individuals, which includes people with IBS and possibly also those with endometriosis. In fact, there are a few studies suggesting that a low FODMAP diet may be effective in reducing symptoms of endometriosis. A study compared the effect of following a low FODMAP diet for four weeks in two groups of women, one with IBS and endometriosis, and the second with IBS alone and found that gut issues were reduced in 72% of women of the first group but only 49% of those in the second group. In another study women with endometriosis were asked whether they wanted to change their diet into a low format diet or a so-called endometriosis diet which we will discuss in a minute. If they didn't want to change they could keep their usual diet and act as control group. They found that women who changed their diet so either the low FODMAP or the endometriosis diet reported lower level of pain after the six month period of the study compared to the beginning. However, there were almost no differences compared to the control group. In fact, the only difference in the low FODMAP group was a small reduction in pain during sexual intercourse. So it seems that a low FODMAP diet, which is a highly personalized diet in which only the food that triggers a reaction in that particular person is 
excluded from the diet may help reducing symptoms in patients with endometriosis and possibly especially in those who also have gut issues but again women were aware of the type of diet they were assigned to and in the second study they actually choose which diet they preferred and in addition there was either no control group or when present as in the second study there was no random assignment of participant to either the intervention or the control group. So as in the case of the gluten-free diet, we cannot be sure that the results we see are due to the low FODMAP diet and not the, to the nocebo effect. The so-called endometriosis diet is a dietary pattern highly recommended on the internet as a treatment for endometriosis but that actually doesn't have any scientific evidence behind. It's an experience-based diet developed and applied by patients themselves who independently decide which food to avoid from their diet and that's based on their personal experience of painful reaction or their belief that that particular food or nutrient would promote disease progression. So now it's very easy to find on the internet recommendations to follow the endometriosis diet along with a long list of foods to avoid to reduce endometriosis related symptoms and this usually includes red meat, lactose and gluten containing product, added sugar and food high in phytoestrogen, especially soy and soy product. There is one study which investigated whether it can actually have an effect on endometriosis related pain. And that's the same study that I mentioned earlier in which women were asked whether they wanted to follow a low FODMAP diet, an endometriosis diet, or whether they wanted to keep their usual diet. This study did not suggest a great effect of diet on endometriosis related pain. After six months, the only statistically significant difference was a greater reduction in bloating in those who follow the endometriosis diet compared to the control group. Two types of supplements have been proposed in relation to endometriosis and that's the omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin D and that's because they both have an anti-inflammatory effect. For the omega-3 fatty acid, a randomized control study found that a daily supplementation for three months resulted in less painkiller medication use and presumably less pain in women with severe menstrual pain but not endometriosis diagnosis compared to the placebo. However, another randomized control study which included young women with endometriosis found that daily supplementation with omega-3 fatty acid for six months did not result in less pain, both compared to the beginning of the study and compared to the control group. Regarding vitamin D, there are three randomized control studies available, all of them showing a significant reduction in pain compared to the beginning of the study. In addition, one of these studies also showed that the reduction in pain perception was greater in the participants who were taking the vitamin D compared to the control group, while the other two groups did not find a significant difference between those taking the vitamin D and those taking the placebo. This means that actually the control group reported less pain compared to the beginning of the study and that reduction was not different than that reported by the people in the vitamin D group. Okay, but what can we do? The hard truth is that the very very few studies that have been published on the topic are of poor or moderate quality at best and cannot provide any definitive answer. And it is important to realize this because it's true when doctors and nutritionists say that there is no such a thing as a diet for endometriosis. But still, I think we can grab some useful information from the current evidence and hopefully we will see more high quality studies in the near future. So first of all, endometriosis is a complex disease which can manifest in many different ways. So we cannot expect the same solution for everyone. So if your diet is unbalanced and nutritionally poor, if you eat too much processed meat, red meat, 
ultra processed food, added sugar and salt, etc., then the first recommendation would be to move towards a more Mediterranean or otherwise plant based diet. This will provide you with adequate nutrition and a wide range of antioxidant and anti inflammatory compounds that may already be sufficient to reduce your pain. If you also suffer from severe gut issues and you feel that some food in particular trigger your symptoms, then a low FODMAP or in some cases a gluten-free diet may be beneficial for you. However, it is important to realize that excluding too many food groups and nutrients from your diet will result in a nutritionally inadequate diet which will not be able to sustain your body and will definitely cause you more harm than good. So the goal should be to exclude only those few food items that trigger your symptoms if any but that should be done with the help of an expert dietitian who can teach you where to find the nutrients that you need in other food let's take as an example a diet that excludes all the food groups that are usually banned in the endometriosis diet the resulting diet would be poor in protein because we are excluding red meat, soy and soy products, or the beans because they are also high in phytoestrogens. We are excluding whole grains that are high in gluten and also dairies which contain lactose. But the resulting diet will also be poor in fiber because we are excluding soy and beans and whole grains. And of course, we'll lack a whole range of vitamins and minerals. So we can definitely expect that this diet will have several health consequences, including endometriosis related issues, because with a diet poor in fiber, we are not feeding the good bacteria in our gut, which produce anti-inflammatory compounds that limit disease progression. Also, soy and other products are usually avoided because they are high in phytoestrogens, which are compounds that resemble the estrogens and that can also bind to the same receptors. However, studies show that overall phytoestrogens produce the opposite effect of estrogens because yes, they bind to the same receptor, but the effect they produce is much weaker. Also, because of their presence, the estrogen molecules cannot bind to the receptor and therefore have an effect. So avoiding soy and other phytoestrogen rich food can actually be counterproductive for people with endometriosis. An important point we can make from these studies is that in this field in particular, the placebo and nocebo effects can be very strong and can seriously affect your pain perception. So for example, if you consider a food good for you, then eating it will automatically reduce your pain regardless of their actual effect on the body. But of course we need to realize that these effects sooner or later will fade away and we don't know exactly how long they will last. And although I understand when you say I don't care if it's placebo or nocebo effect, I feel less pain and that's the only thing that matters for me you need to realize that modifying your diet based on false beliefs can have serious consequences, including the money that you spend on useless supplements, the nutritional deficiencies that you may incur if you avoid food groups without adequate nutritional knowledge, but also the stress that you will feel to keep up with all these nonsense dietary rules while also living your life and managing your disease. Stress can be a major trigger, especially for gut issue. So before excluding food groups from your diet, maybe consider whether you can reduce the level of stress you're experiencing. So please be careful and don't trust everyone who wants to sell you a magical solution because unfortunately it doesn't exist. So if you like this video, maybe you should watch this other video in which I talk about the plant-based diet to help you decide whether it's the diet for you. That's it for now and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!